Good, so I believe we're live. A very uh, very good afternoon. This is Nick Jones and I'm the Pet Behaviourist with Pet Plan and I'm very pleased to be with you all this afternoon answering your behaviour questions. And the date today is the 25th of August, it's 3pm. And what we're going to do initially is just bring my new dog Ruby in. You, know, you may recall seeing her before on my last Q and A. Uh, Ruby, come, and she looks a right old mess, and she's still a bit wet. Excuse me. Let's make her look decent and proper, hey. And the little story is this morning is that we nearly lost her. We had a lovely, we thought we'd take in a nice little riverside walk. And she's following her big brother Max along the riverside and they're up ahead of us, has put her down. And I hear this splash. Max reappears within no time and then Ruby wasn't there to be seen. So I ran up ahead and found that Ruby was in the river, which is still quite full flow. And uh, instead of her sort of making up towards the bank or getting forward, she was actually being washed downstream, much to my alarm. So I ran uh, about 20, 30 yards downstream in preparation to catch her or expecting her to come out the other end, and she never did. By this stage, I'm just stood there in my underpants and trainers, <laughs> fully expecting to have to go in and, uh, and rescue Ruby. Thankfully, I could hear some scrabbling on the bank. She came up. She was fine, but she looked a bit uh, looked a bit uh, shocked, but otherwise no harm done. So it's a timely reminder, isn't it, about the control we have of our dogs. And uh, we, we can all fall foul of dogs doing doggy things, you know, and just trying to be a little step ahead of our dogs, thinking about how close the dogs are uh, and how much control we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Because in my day-to-day uh, -day job I find that a lot of problems especially with dogs out in public which as you might imagine uh, constitutes a large part of the sorts of problems that I'm asked to help with uh, that has the, the it sort of beginnings in maybe a dog doing something that might just be beyond the owner's control okay so that's something to think about and uh, it was a timely reminder for me today so as you know, we always have a, a lovely helper behind the screen asking the questions and I've got Kim here with me today. And we have a few questions that have come in ahead of time, so we'll address those first. So Kim, fire away with the first question. Okay, the first question is from Judith. My female French Bulldog had a litter of puppies before I got her and lived with a pug and the father of her pups that she was not at all interested in. She settled in well in the house, but outside, she is very difficult with other dogs that we meet and go even goes for birds and cats and mm. pulls me. Um, her hackles go up and this is on every walk. I, I can't go to dog classes or go anywhere and enjoy our time with her. Please help, what can I do? Mm. What a difficult one because the chances are that your dog uh, was behaving or had an inclination to behave in this way before you acquired her. And so there is a good chance that that behaviour is uh, what we might term as well embedded in the dog and some behaviours that the longer embedded they are or the longer they spend practising a behaviour, in theory it can take a bit longer to address it. You know, ideally, and, and this is the difficulty which I find myself saying quite frequently on li uh, live questions and answers, uh, whether they're my own on my own page or with Pet Plan, is that you know, it's the sort of thing that I could easily spend half a day looking at with the owner. And so what we really need to look at here are some, uh, the, the sort of the top and the bottom, as it were, of the issue so that we can make some good progress with you and offer you some way forward. I think having said all of that, it would still be prudent to suggest that you look at seeking some one-to-one -one help because I have a feeling here that with a dog that is displaying that sort of behaviour to not just other dogs but cats and squirrels and everything else, all animals, then we need to take a much more all-encompassing look at the issue. Having said that, I'm often greatly encouraged at the way that dogs can improve their behaviour in what is sometimes a relatively short period. So be positive and let's make a, a good start. Very often at the beginning, we also find that it's very sensible to look at behaviours in the home as well. Is the dog listening to you in the home as well as out of the home? Because if we 
when we go out and expect the dog or hope the dog to be uh, listening to us in public, well, is the dog even doing that in the house? So maybe sit down with a pen and paper and to go through all of the various behaviours that you ask of your dog, whether they are uh, basic things such as feeding or asking your dog to go to bed, uh, go to its bed, things of this nature. They're very, very simple and they all sit in the foundations of the dog's behaviour. And if we can get those right, I, that's often where I start with com more complicated cases because if we have good foundations then as you might expect we can begin to apply other sort of modules as it were on top. If you were able to teach your dog at least to sit and to pay attention to you uh, let's say with high value food, then that would be a very good start and I would be uh, encouraging you to go down that road. So if you are able to go out with your dog with a little hand, uh, a handful of chicken bits, then in theory each time your dog sees something of di great distraction, you could then be saying to your dog, sit to stay and then uh, to allow us to uh, distract your dog. I've just had, speaking of the word distraction, I've got Big Max just coming to the frame, so if there's any knocks and wobbles on the tripod, it'll be Big Max. Um, it's not easy to quickly show, move the camera around, but rest assured he's here. Um, come up here. Come on. Up, 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 up. Come on. You can do it. Oh, oh. Come on. No, he's just going to pull at me. Over there. So, distracting a dog when the dog itself is distracted is a good plan of action. So your dog sees, let's say, a squirrel and your dog is on a lead. Rather than to allow your dog to just pull and scrabble and make a great deal of fuss, it would be far better for you to ask your dog to sit and to stay and to use the high value food uh, as a distraction and then as a reward, okay, until the, uh, the distraction of the other animal has passed. And once it has passed, then we are in a better position to move on again, okay? So in some respects, it can be a bit overwhelming to know where to start with a dog that is highly reactive in public spaces. But in summary, make sure your foundation behaviours are good in the home, i.e. is the dog listening to you? Can you ask your dog to do some very basic things? And once you have a feeling of traction in that respect, we can begin to make other improvements in public and you should stand a better chance of uh, seeing that behaviour come through. Um, so good luck with that. I hope that begins, begins to give you some little ideas. Mm. To my relief Max is laid down so I don't think we're going to have any IT flying over the place. Max's tail is this long so uh, it can be problematic. So Kim, what else do we have for us? Uh, next section is, is similar Nick but mm -hmm. slightly different. Um, we actually no, we'll we'll have that one maybe a bit later. Okay. Um, why has my three-year-old Cavalier King Charles Spaniel started to dominate a teddy? She's never done this before, and she has been spayed. Okay. So spaniels. This is a slightly broad comment or general comment, uh, but I, in my sort of day-to-day -day behavior work, do see that spaniels have a great tendency to be possessive, and so if you are simply seeing a possessive trait in your dog, uh, th well, it depends because like any behaviour, we, we can have a, an escalating uh, curve in the sense of seriousness. So we might say that a dog is possessive over a teddy very, very mildly and you're able to go in and remove that item uh, without any difficulty. Or then some dogs will go all the way to the upper echelons of that behaviour and then become very growly and aggressive, possessive over that item and potentially would bite you if you threaten to remove that item. So I don't know, of course, where you think your dog is on that scale. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions and think that it's on the lower third of that scale, given the way that you've uh, worded things. One other little element for you to consider, and this is something you might want to discuss with your vet, even though I accept your dog has been spayed, 
is that it may be still some sense of uh, phantom pregnancy there. And so if that's something that, that you could discuss quickly with your vet just to uh, rule out in or out any other possibilities that would be useful as well I think. So I think it coming back to putting the pregnant phantom pregnancy to one side it then depends on uh, how much your dog is being protective of that item and how the behaviour is manifesting as well. So if your dog is simply uh, being a bit grabby and running off with the item into its bed I wouldn't worry too much. There are certain things that we can overlook in the grand uh, scheme of things. Whereas if you feel that the dog is being a bit possessive and it is leading to other problematic behaviours, well, you know, what I would do quite honestly is I would remove the item initially for a time, maybe a week or two. Some homes I go to have a, um, a, a, a very large number of items for the dog and the dog is or can be to an extent spoilt with uh, toys and it just it can become possessive over all of them and if we're seeing that then again get a box put all of the toys in the box put the lid on the box and block access for a week or two what I do like because we're not trying to not allow the dog to play because that's the idea with toys but if a dog isn't playing with the toys and then just becomes possessive then we're into a different region of behaviour and that the toys aren't actually working in the way that we hoped to begin with. So this is something I encourage you to just to have a, a, a little analysis of and to think about how much your dog is being protective over that item. When you, uh, so I just want to come back on myself, if we have all these dogs uh, toys in a basket we can allow uh, interaction with one or two toys at a time and that's something that you can oversee okay so you can go to the box get a toy out allow your dog to have some interactive play with you with that item and then when it's finished you can put the toy away and this can help just settle down uh, your dog practicing high levels of uh, protective behavior or possessive behavior rather over those items also what can be useful as a little plan is that you say you get something like six items and you grade them from low value at the bottom up to the highest value and then you try over those six items to stage them one by one so you get number one, two, three, four, five, six starting at low interest to high interest and starting with the lowest interest toy you can just spend a few days practicing the hold and give with that item. Most dogs will hold an item if you waggle it in front of them because that's the, their instinctive response. Uh, the difficulty is getting them to let it go. So you can either just, just take your time with this, don't become confrontational or uh, you know rough with the dog in the sense of trying to retrieve the item. It's quite okay to do uh, a swap for a high value food item uh, but ideally that in itself would be faded out as you become more and more uh, or the dog becomes more and more used to dealing with this. So that little method of working through six items over, you could give yourself a month to do that easily, can be a very good way of teaching the dog that giving an item that the dog perceives to be of high value to you is very uh, it's okay, it's not a threat, it's not going to lose the item, it's just a handing over and that you're not a threat to that whole game. All right. So in summary, talk to the vet just to see that there aren't symptoms there of uh, phantom pregnancy uh, and then initially with the toys remove them for a week or two, although you can give controlled access to a toy uh, with you in the background and then to give yourself about a month working through these six items that you've graded uh, so that you can practice with your dog and teach your dog that giving up an item is okay, it's not an actual loss, it's just a, a, a part of the comings and goings of life. Okay, so good luck with that one. I, I expect that possessiveness of items, toys, uh, will be pertinent to many people listening. Uh, it's not just spaniels, of course, that can do that. Um, lots of other breeds can do it as well, and crossbreeds are just as prone to it.
but the I guess if I were to think this through a bit more the spaniels tend to be very prone to it in my experience and other gun dogs can be more of that nature as well because they are they have been developed to go and get things and to hold things and they will often do that without training or teaching but the actual teaching of, a, of uh, the methodology with the gun dog is to bring it back to the hand and in a fit state, not crushed up and crumpled, and, and then to release that item when asked to do so. And that it's the bringing the back and releasing the items that tends to be the problem really. And that's where we need to teach our dogs, ideally from a very young age, to hold and give. There is a little YouTube video I've made exactly on the hold and give, simply youtube.com forward slash alpha dog behaviour. And if you put in there the hold and give exercise, you'll see me with Big Max actually, albeit he was a puppy. So we're talking about 10 years ago um, in my lounge and we're going through it because it's a very useful exercise to not just show others, but to teach my own dog. So there you go. A good comprehensive answer there. Thank you. We have another question here from Jill Lowe. Why does my cockapoo go wild in open spaces when I let her off the lead? Then she comes back and she can be aggressive. She's a sweetie otherwise. Aggressive to the owner, do we think? Let her off and then come back and be aggressive. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to think so. Yeah, because so when, so when a dog sometimes returns to its owner, Jill, uh, the dog is um, so overexcited that we can the dog can get into the levels of what we might call manic behavior i recall a visitor i saw this year a very nice dog owned by a very nice young couple and the uh, the dog was being so manic when off lead that it would run and i've heard i've had this come up numerous times over the years the dog would run at the owner and jump up and grab the coat or the sleeve of the owner and this would come across as well uh, potentially aggressive behavior but I don't think it is a, 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 naturally it needs to be seen firsthand to really establish what what it is but it could well be that your dog is just becoming a bit manic now how do we deal with that a couple of things come to mind Firstly, rather than to be all or nothing, and what I mean by that is that we go into the park, dog on the lead initially, in your instance, Jill, I'm, I'm expecting, and then you let the dog loose, uh, and then you will also find it difficult to manage your dog's behaviour, as because you're describing that here. So a good in-between is that you transition and actually put your dog on a long training line, and lots of my customers will know how much I favour a long training line because it's a nice in-between step of working towards giving complete freedom and yet remaining in control if, it's, if it becomes necessary. It's not perfect a long training line. I usually recommend 30 to 50 foot depending on the uh, activity level of the dog and the size of the dog. Some dogs will not never venture 20 feet away from you so in that instance a 30 foot line from the pet store will be fine bigger dogs that like to roam and to cover ground probably 50 foot maybe even longer but if you have your dog on a long training line you will stand a better chance of having control making sure the dog comes back when requested because if we were having a face-to-face -face conversation, that question would come up to you. And we may find that you'll be saying, well, the recall's not bad, but it could be somewhat better. So that's something we could look at because it all comes in to the pot. I've got uh, Max snoring down here now. So any side effects, it's not Kim, it's Max <laughs> snoring. Okay, so, uh, but having, ensuring that you have control in a nice global sense of your dog is, is going to be important in this sort of instance. If you had a helper with you, and let's say I was the helper and you were away from me behind the camera, let's say, I, I could be holding that line. And if I perceived that my dog, rather sorry, your dog was going to run at you, I could begin to break the dog's uh, actions and energy and sort of break it break it break it and stop 
before the dog is allowed to indulge in that behaviour. And depending on the severity of your dog's behaviour, i.e. or rather meaning how much speed and um, mania your dog is employing if running at you, and, and I hope I'm making the right assumption here, then I would possibly stop the dog more abruptly in the process. I would have a little body harness on the dog so we can do a, a fairly quick stop without any damage to the dog. Be very careful. Uh, long lines should not be attached to head harnesses because we can have a jolting effect and even some collars, depending on how active the dog is, could be a bit cutting as well. So a good fitted body harness with actually, I like a little link going from the body harness to the neck collar because I've seen this happen a few times, uh, folks, where a dog will back away and do this. Some A collie I once saw do this knowing that it could get out of the harness and indeed the dog was loose and then we had a, a, a bit of a game catching the dog. So yeah, check that you've got the right equipment on your dog, okay? Now another little tip, Jill, is if you have your dog running at you, it, your body language and how you respond to it can make a difference. So if you, um, what breed was it? Kim, do we it remember? Was a poo. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, so with that sort of size dog, I think you would be able to take a good strong stance. I won't stand up because I'll be uh, out of the picture frame, but I would basically be standing up square to your dog and saying about ten feet away, assuming your dog's running at a good speed at you, and use a key word that you want to use, such as uh, stop. Or you could try the practicing the instant down that takes I won't go off on too much of a tangent but if you can teach your dog what's called the instant down worth a little Google on that one um, because you could say to your dog as it's approaching you using the same good body language down in a firm voice like you mean it um, and that can sort of discourage your dog enough because that 10 15 feet away uh, it gives the dog enough time, assuming it's coming in at speed, to process the command and for you not to be leapt up at or, or um, you know, treated roughly. So I am going to go with that assumption because that, that does come up quite a bit. Uh, dogs will basically uh, abuse their <laughs> owners a little bit, especially when they're overexcited. So quite a few little ideas there. In summary, Make sure all the other basics are looking good as well. Don't just fake focus on the problem. The problem often I present as the top of the pyramid. So we've got that capstone, but actually that's just the, the specific top end of the problem. And when we take that away, we have a lot of foundation. And that represents, or if we were to go in there, that we would find all the dog's basics. So ensure the basics are good. Um, use a long training line work with a helper that could maybe anticipate your dog charging at you in this way and get them to do some good solid uh, braking action, slowing the dog down rapidly whilst we combine it with you using your own body language and telling the dog to stop, okay, or to sit or to down, whatever works for you um, and worth working on those instant sits, instant downs. Um, I think, have I got a bit of time I could get, talk a little bit about the instant sit or the instant down or should we... we, we ha we've got quite a lot of puppy questions. Okay, so, so, so yes, yeah, so I'll revert to my earlier suggestion that you Google the instant down and alternatively you're welcome to email me direct, nickjones at alphadogbehaviour.co.uk and I can go through that with you. So I hope that helps. I hope I made the right assumptions there um, and uh, good luck with your cockapoo. Thank you. Go for it, Kim. We've got just a couple of puppy questions here, which I think Love there's puppy several. Questions. <laughs> Barbara is asking, um, she has a puppy that's coming home soon, ah. um, and she'd like to know how to introduce that puppy to her dogs. She has a Cairn Terrier, mm -hmm. which is quite dominant, okay. so she's a little concerned. Dominant. Uh, when we say the dog's quite dominant, that could mean it's an absolute nightmare with other dogs, but uh, we'll, we'll take it on face value. Um, when Kim said we have some puppy questions, I then I, I light up inside initially because I think, well, 
the subject of puppies how lovely um, and oh a puppy question how easy is that you have to, I sometimes think of my work if I've got a puppy visit I think well that's going to be a nice easy morning for me uh, but actually the puppies can be because they are so new and everything is forming and um, needs looking at that it can be one of the most complicated periods of um, a dog and, and dog owner's life. Yes. Barbara's just given us a little bit more information. Thank you, Barbara. She says she's bossy. Bossy. There <laughs> we go. Thank you for the clarification. That's nice. It actually lets me know that people are watching. <laughs> so, OK, well, I would rather use I, I feel a bit more assured having the word bossy uh, than dominant because bossy we can manage. Dominant is potentially leading into something a bit more serious. Uh, anyway, anyway, so to answer your question, make sure you let the dogs meet in a neutral area. I would place your Cairn Terrier on a lead, okay, because again it's back to having some very basic control. When I say a neutral area, it depends where you live, you know, if you've got if you've got access to a little bit of quiet space around you, then you could take your dog and the puppy to that space. With puppies, of course, you'll be given all this information about not to put the puppy down in ground before it's vaccinated. I think if you choose carefully an area that's not heavily uh, used by dogs, then that, that could suffice. You know, even if it was, say, you had a family member with a large garden, uh, or a neighbour with a large garden that you could do those initial introductions, that would be nice. When I, just going back um, 10 months, so it would have been just before Christmas, obtained Ruby, we have a space around the back here which is reasonably neutral and we let the dogs meet there. We didn't do it in the house. So that's the absolute essence of my answer is you place your existing dog on lead I would also have your puppy on a lead as well and that we do dog here dog here and that we allow some controlled meetings a little nose to nose just a couple of seconds bring puppy away or the you know one dog one person one dog by the way don't try to do it all on your own bit of extra information maybe yes. Barbara's come back to say that she will be going straight into the house so they're May, she may not have that opportunity. Well, I, I mean, that is that necessary? That's my, I mean, naturally it's a bit difficult because we can't converse, but uh, that's very easily or in real time. But, you know, that may be your intention at the moment to bring puppy straight into the house. But I, I have, and it may well go okay, all right? So I don't wish to lead you to think that it would be wrong to do that. But what we're really looking at here is setting everything up, putting our ducks in order so that the situation goes as well as possible. So, I, yes. Barbara's also, they do have a, their own garden that's yes. quite large. So I, I guess she's asking whether yeah. their own garden. Okay, so be. yes, got the, if, if it is on property, the garden as opposed to the house, ideally. OK, and if you trust, you know, you, uh, again, it's an element we can't discuss in, in depth, but if you trust your uh, existing dog enough and uh, I would be asking, well, how is your existing dog with other dogs and these sorts of things? Um, and that would lead me to uh, in through my answer on how we judge it. But if you're saying, no, she's good with other dogs, never been a problem, never bitten or barked at other dogs, uh, then I would be saying, well, your garden should be OK. So do that but both dogs on the lead brief introductions don't overdo it make sure you supervise them into the future as well don't allow it just to be one meeting and then to think great we've crossed that hurdle that hurdle is there under your nose really for at least the first month and I would be even with my own when I brought Ruby in I was uh, never leaving them alone together Ruby was always going into her crate when we couldn't supervise directly okay so I'm sure you'll be fine but that's how I would do it and thank you for the question and thank you for your little uh, elaborations along the way Barbara and good luck let let us know how you get on that would be super okay another puppy question yes um, I have a four month this is from Sharon I have a four month old puppy that's constantly nipping and biting my feet ah. what should I do to try and stop him 
Yes, puppies biting feet is, is quite common and of course puppies biting anything is pretty common, biting and chewing. We had a fair share of um, collateral damage here, not too much actually. If I was, to be honest, I think we lost a couple of uh, phone charging cables which were our fault. Um, I think Sarah lost a pair of slippers along the way, uh, but there we go. So it's really a case of minimising these things as much as possible. Dogs love to see things moving and then to, it's a bit of an instinctive thing, They when they see it moving, especially slippers at the same level as a puppy along the floor and the slippers tend to be fluffy and shuffle along, that they see it as a great game. And of course we as a new owner to this puppy may take great delight in this initially until we then realise that it's becoming a problem behaviour. So um, I'm just going to give you a couple of simple ideas here. When you enter a room and you know the puppy is loose in that room and you could actually set this up so it gives you a chance to be proactive on the behaviour. You, When you enter that room you can sort of expect that your dog is going to do this. Enter the room, there's a couple of ways of doing this and I'll run through them both I think. If you're on your own you can enter the room, if your dog goes for your slippers issue some sort of interrupting sound along the line. I personally use a, the, a verbal sound along the lines of ah, ah and so it would need to sound like that as well. It, we don't want to go ah ah because if it is it's no consequence to the dog. We don't want to frighten the dog but equally we're trying to say to the dog oh no that's not to be done. So you emit that sound at the same time you stand dead still. Stop moving. Ask your dog to sit have some food on you, ask your dog to sit and once the dog's sitting, good girl, okay, and then you can move away. Now if your dog goes back straight back into it, emit the correcting ver verbal sound, okay, ah, ah, and then we can uh, ask the dog to sit and to reward and move on. You could, you might be surprised, but we, you could in theory not reward at all. Um, it could just be a sit. And so we give a, a much, because it can depend on the, that behaviour. It sounds like, oh, a puppy going for your slippers. It sounds like no big deal. But actually, depending on a few things, such as the breed, the age of the puppy, because we still might be calling a dog at six, seven, eight months a puppy. And actually you're really getting into quite adolescent behaviour and quite grown up behaviour, it could even be turning into quite unpleasant behaviour. So you see, we can take, we can generalise and take this little concept of a puppy and going for your slippers and we think, oh well we can address that, no problem. And you should be able to, but actually we could then be getting into big dogs with puppies and the behaviour is much more, uh, could be much more advanced and much more of a problem. Another little approach, uh, so that's one way of dealing with it. Another way is that you do have a helper and the dog is on a lead as you enter the room or as you walk past the dog in the room. You wait for the dog to do the inevitable, which is going for your slippers. You can still emit the ah uh, ah, uh, but the person holding the lead can just uh, use the lead to stop the dog from making further advances. That's all it is. There's no heavy correcting to the dog. It's just a stoppage using the lead. And it can just, it could just simply break the habit. A lot of behaviours are habits. The dog gets a bit of fun out of it. It registers in the brain that that's worth doing. It's not really, the dog isn't really being told to stop because the owner may not have the idea uh, or the tools to do so. So I hope that makes sense. Option one which is a, a useful option to consider because you don't need any help. But as soon as the dog goes for your slippers, you stop, you issue the ah, ah simultaneously, you ask your dog to sit, you can treat it if you think it's going to help. If you don't have a treat, don't sweat it and then just move on. All right. Option two is you do just what I've described, but you could have a lead on the dog and have a helper to physically stop the dog. That second part of that solution I think would be more useful if the dog was bigger and a bit more advanced in its behaviour, okay, because we do want to stop it straight away. That incidentally could be exactly the same approach could be applied to things like jumping up as well, 
okay so what we really want the dog to do when we enter the room if if we think it wants to have some interaction with us is to come up to us and to sit and once the dog is sitting then we can lean over and give the dog some praise okay you know dog rearing a young dog is about having a balanced approach naturally we want to be in what i often describe to customers is this green light where we're loving life with the puppy and the puppy's loving life with us and everything feels fantastic but occasionally when the dog is doing something that we certainly wouldn't want it to do as an adult dog such as grabbing clothing jumping up mouthing too hard we need to flash a little red light but not in a severe way no no shouting nothing heavy physically but we're being quite clear to the dog and going ah, that's not acceptable and when we hit that and it's possibly harder to do than we imagine um, we then have what I would call balance because balance doesn't mean that we're 50% nice and 50% harsh actually you can get 50, you can get total balance by being 99% loving and that green light provided we are uh, you, you know actually stopping the dog when it's doing something that's unacceptable so I hope that makes sense and I hope it sounds reasonable because that's what we're trying to be there's another puppy question here um, well prob probably a slightly older dog it's because it's about a year old now this is from Beth we have a Labrador cross collie puppy she'll be a year in November and is doing really well on and off the lead walking to heel but when she goes back into the house, she just bounds all over us and the furniture. When visitors come, I think she scares them, even though they know she only wants to say hello. We've started shutting her away when we have people over, but she cries. And in the long run, I don't want to have to do this for the rest of her life. Mm. Any advice would be great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Does she give a name? That's Beth. Beth, thank you for that question, Beth, because it actually tags on brilliantly and gives me an opportunity to simply reinforce what I was just saying. Um, and it's about getting that balance. You've had, let's assume, a nice walk with your dog and uh, a lab cross collie is going to be a very active dog. And then... So you've had this big, long green light. It's basically an enjoyable experience. And then you come home <clears throat> and the dog decides, it finds it exciting and wants to then use the house as a, a, an ongoing playground. But dogs need to learn and learning takes place usually from us down to the dog. That's the usual flow because we have concepts of what is good and not so good behavior. And so it's our responsibility to demonstrate to the dog what we do want it to do, uh, or rather, let's say, what it can do and what it can't do, putting it broadly speaking. And of course, we don't want the dog treating the home, and that's a bigger dog as well, as a, uh, you know, a, a bouncy castle type experience once it comes home. My answer to your question is to keep the lead on the dog when you enter the house. It's as simple as that. <laughs> because if in many respects you keep a lead on the, the dog uh, and for how long of course is something we'll, we'll touch on next but keeping a lead on the dog allows you to have ongoing control I just want to back up maybe a little so I'm going to make a couple of assumptions let's assume that you have put the dog in the car at the park and you come home when you get on your drive uh, you must ensure, please, that the dog comes out in a controlled way. So you lift the hatch of the boot or the door of the side of the car. Don't let the dog out of that car until you say, you count to five in your head. Come on then, out you come. And the dog's on the lead, okay? You then walk up the drive, which you may be doing anyway. You may not come home by car. So if you're now in a situation where the dog's on the lead, you're coming up to the, the door to enter the home, that's where that also needs to be calm and controlled. Those two words are really important. And it will be your job, really, as the manager of the dog to say, look, we're coming back into the house and the house is a place where we have calmness. It's not a playground. They can be themselves. I've got Pip here and Max, they both had a walk. So they crashed out and they do have a little play occasionally, but they're not allowed to sort of 
ramp up and down the stairs and to go mad. Outside is where they do that, okay? So the entry into the home, which is the point I was trying to demonstrate, should be calm and controlled. And then we are bringing in, it stands to reason, and in practice in my experience, that we're bringing into the home a dog which is much calmer. And then you, your, your chances of success with that dog uh, will be infinitely better. Because if you let the dog come up to the back door, you maybe wipe its feet and then open the door and the dog charges in, you've kind of lost the battle there. So I'm thinking, we'll wind it back, we'll come up to the door, that you leave the lead on the dog, open the door, don't let the dog go straight through the door. If you have that, just bring the door back. We're not trying to hit the dog with the door, so be careful. But what we really want is to be able to open the door, the dog is relaxed at my side. This might take a few days, but it work at it and it will come. Open the door. If the dog tries to rush through, shut the door. But be careful you don't catch the dog. So be just be careful with that technique. Um, until the dog thinks, oh, I best sit here and be nice. Okay. Once you have that calm look in your dog, slip in front of your dog and step through the gap you created in the door. So then you should find yourself facing the dog with the dog outside and you inside. Count to five again in your head, at which point you're still holding the lead. You say, come on, in you come, all right? Uh, I would let the dog then have a little drink of water. Um, you could continue to hold the lead. Uh, maybe I would anticipate, it depends on the dog and the severity of the behavior. I would envisage something like 10 to 15 minutes. Rather than once, once you get to the end of that period and you think, I think he's fit to come off the lead, Let's do something a bit crafty. Let's just let go of the lead and let your da dog trail the lead in the home. Because if you think, ah, I've let go of the lead and he, he looks quite calm, he's going on to his bed, this is great, he could still revert to that behaviour, especially in the early days, say tomorrow onwards for a few days. And so, um, but the beauty is if you have a lead on the dog, you can at least stand on it if it's long enough or you can snatch a hold of it Bring your dog to your feet, sit, stay, steady on, maybe on your bed, now settle down. Something of that sort of feeling and that sort of vocal tone because we're trying to say to the dog, because we can't give it extended sentences in English, we know that of course, but it's always worth remembering that we can't directly converse with the dog. So what we're trying to do is to impart a a way of being with the dog through our tone of voice and how we are and how much control we've got of the dog and you know this is true for many animals uh, so but dogs especially which is what we're focusing on is uh, the, the element that we're looking to control so calm control by keeping the lead on your dog until it's calm enough then let it drag the lead for maybe another 10-20 minutes and then we can take the lead off. And that final removal of the lead might be a very subtle coming over, quietly unclipping it, putting it by your side and just walking away without really any interaction with your dog. Another quick random thought, if your dog is really truly highly active and if you've just got the one single dog this is made easier, is that you could provide something like a hollow rubber toy, plenty of those on the market, where you could put a portion of the dog's uh, daily food allowance in it if it's dried food or if it's a wet food you could stuff it into that device and give that to your dog to allow them to channel themselves into the gaming of food naturally we should wait a while for the dog not to be panting and to be calm before we feed them but you know giving them something to act actively distract them could be um, uh, helpful for you. Another quick final thought is, and I would just be discussing this with you if I were face to face, but is the dog getting enough exercise in the first instance or, funnily enough, is the dog being over-exercised? So what we're trying to look for in our dogs post-exercise is a dog that we would say he or she is content. I know that they've had enough. They've not, ha they've not been given too little and they've not been given too much either because 
if you hit either extreme, too little or too much, we, we may see the sort of behaviour you're describing. Uh, so just try to think about hitting that sweet spot, okay? I, that's a fantastic question. I really enjoyed addressing that. Thank you. We, we had a comment um, from some, some uh, from a viewer saying that um, they tried the door technique mm. and that it only took a couple of, of tries with their excitable puppy, thanks yes. to Nick's advice. Oh, bless. So um, I bet that's Lisa. Um, it's Victoria. Oh, OK. Never assume who it is. <laughs> um, well, that's lovely, Victoria, because slowing a dog down i mean dogs have no difficulty in going what we might term as 100 miles an hour this is half the problem with our dogs is that, is that little ruby is an absolute brilliant example she's everywhere at 100 miles an hour hence if you go back to the beginning of this video um my story of her falling into the river this morning and nearly getting washed away so it's the, it's not we don't have difficulty in getting our dogs to be so active, it's really getting them to slow down uh, so we can slow them down enough to give them input so that they are safe and that they're not making mistakes which you might term as incompatible with human living, such as jumping up and running around the house like a lunatic. You know, we want, of course, calm, happy dogs. Okay. Uh, another question here, uh, not a, not uh, certainly it doesn't say it's a puppy, um, from Abby saying, my spaniel has really bad separation anxiety. He is a mummy's boy and often just wants her. How does she train him out of this one? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because the puppies look so adorable, we find it difficult to put them down. We have this new acquisition of this little thing that depends upon us entirely for everything and to a large extent they continue to depend upon us entirely for everything throughout their lives and again I'm going to bring back this idea of balance you know dogs need to be taught to be left alone they need to be shown how to be independent she doesn't say how old the dog is does she exactly no, no. no. Um, but nonetheless, regardless of the age, that, that those comments would still stand. So teaching our dogs to be independent, uh, or in other words, teaching them to be okay to be left alone, is a big skill because as you're experiencing, and as others will experience with older dogs with the same issue, when you can't leave your dog alone uh, and feel comfortable in doing so, knowing that your dog isn't crying or being destructive or however it, that behaviour is um, manifesting, it can be very upsetting, not, not, to men not just for the puppy, but for you as an owner as well. It, again, I'm going to have to run down some assumptive routes on this one because I don't have you here to uh, engage in a nice conversation, but we just need to start with short periods where the dog can be left alone and then we build them up okay that's sort of the big picture thinking what we do when we leave a dog alone uh, can also have a bearing on how the dog perceives that time of being left alone so we can leave the dog with interesting items but they need to be safe of course and appropriate for the size and the age of the dog so for example we can't ingest something that would be a problem but if you could get a um, I, it's traditional to use a hollow stuffing toy for a rubber device you can fill that with soft food if the if the dog is food motivated many are most are easily that can have a, a great benefit and so if you can distract your dog uh, when leaving it alone then that can be a very good starting point even now if I'm leaving Ruby uh, in the uh, hallway downstairs and I think I'm going to leave her for an hour she's 10 months she can be left quite okay but I might just go in quickly in, into the food uh, bin and get a handful of kibble and, and throw it on the floor and I can see her through the glass as I leave she's going nuts trying to find the food so she's not she's identifying the idea of me leaving as something quite interesting and actually acceptable and agreeable even so that's the sort of thing i would encourage you to go the route i would encourage you to go down in your day-to-day -day interactions with the dog just a few broad tips 
daytime sleeping if you're using a cage I would encourage you to get the dog into the cage uh, if people are at home with the dogs in the day nothing wrong with that at all but you, it's easy to end up with a dog on your lap a lot of the time asleep okay and that is a, it, it's sort of nice but really you're, you, that is the sort of thing that engenders a dog not to learn to be left alone. So if you see your dog falling asleep, what I've tended to do with mine is to lift them up quietly, put them in the crate, settle them down, shut the door, maybe cover the crate. Uh, of course, I don't even know if you're really using a crate. If not, it might be helpful for you to introduce that, uh, even though that may feel like a fresh little hill to climb because once you are able to put the dog in the crate without too much difficulty, then you've got a secure, safe place to leave your dog. So yeah, just be careful that you are uh, implementing short periods to begin with. And we might be talking 30, 60 seconds behind a closed door um, with some form of distraction that hopefully will help. <clears throat> and that as your dog becomes more settled in that behavior, uh, then you can extend those periods as well. Uh, and I think I'm going to sort of leave it at that for now. But the, separ the subject of separation anxiety in young dogs or puppies is actually quite common and quite a big one. I think I want to reassure you to say that if you just have a little sensible plan of action and uh, based on the things I've said already to you, you should in due course see your dog being much, much more settled. I was commenting today on today's walk with Ruby where I was very keen that I was able to call her away from other dogs so that firstly she could play with other dogs that, but more importantly or certainly just as importantly when I want to say Ruby this way I can say that and that she'll turn promptly and come back and just maybe this month I'm seeing that come together. So the moral of the story is don't forget about the long-term picture, keep working, keep working, and if you're doing it by and large in the right way, it will come good, okay? So good luck and thank you. I have another question here from Pam. I have a Chihuahua rescue who becomes aggressive when he realizes he's about to be taken out for a walk. We can't take his lead off because there could be times when we won't get it back on. Mm -hmm. He won't tolerate brushing, bathing, having a winter coat put on, and he goes for her out of the blue when being petted. That's enough to make me stop and in my tracks. The simple answer to that uh, is that you need to break everything down into individual components because as Kim just listed there, you have a list actually of items and it sounds to me, just to give a quick um, a response, that your dog is controlling what you can or cannot do. So the, a better word is dictating. The dog is dictating when it can be uh, petted, when it can come back, uh, groomed and so on, based on the list that Kim's just given. So <clears throat> I think it would benefit you to look at each of those areas individually I don't think I've got the time or the, well, time basically to address them all with you today. Um, can you, are you able to come back on some of those points though? What was the first one? Let me just go back the, one second. Sorry, there's a bit of scrolling up and down. <laughs> Nothing's easy, is it? Uh, but what I think the first one was when you take it for a walk, it's on a lead initially and they don't let it off the lead because they then have a job getting it back on. Yes, it's... Um we can't take his lead off because there'd be times when they wouldn't be able to get it back on. Yeah. Brushing, bathing, having yeah. a winter coat put on okay. and being and when being petted. Yes. So I'm going to one one little thought for you is when when taking your dog for a walk it's a dog needs to be in chihuahuas can be really quite active athletic little dogs. So the chances are your dog is being not being given adequate exercise because of the issue with the lead and because you're, you're, you're getting the lead on, you're going for a lead based walk and that will mean that the dog is getting no more exercise than you. And we know, of course, that dogs can do, I don't know, five to 10 times more than a human could on an average walk. So my tip on that res in that respect is to, when leaving the house, actually get a 30 foot lead 
and clip that on your dog and then use that bundled up in one hand with a short length in the other use that to take your dog up to the park uh, the longest uh, flexible lead you can get is to my knowledge 26 feet so if you can use a like a, a long training line 30 to 50 feet uh, I would consider a 50 foot lead if the dog is quite active and I would then go into the park and let that lead loose on the floor hold the end of course and then your dog can charge up and down because then when you come back to the house you're going to have a much more relaxed dog it's going to be more tired and a tired dog tends to be a better behaved dog and a, a tired dog is much more likely to allow you to do all of the other things that you list now I think you in the hope that your dog is food driven I would take a simple stance that this much well this much is let's do it another way in this mug is the quantity of your dog's daily food allowance whether that's dry or wet it doesn't matter um, and rather than to give all of that food to your dog over one or two or maybe three meals depending how many meals a day you offer usually two I would say I wouldn't give any food via the, that bowl at all because that food is coming to your dog what we would call could call free of charge and so let's put your dog in a position it's not a bad one but let's put your dog in a position whereby he has to work for that food so you could measure out this food at the beginning of the day you take that food out on walks with you and uh, you can get through as much of that as you wish doing recalls uh, and then when you're back in the home I think we really need to look at desensitization so that will simply mean you having a quantity of that food out from the mug and then we have your dog's interest okay and we can then say to your dog to sit we could practice having some lead clipping on treat treat you give two or three treats if you wish take it off treat treat and again I know this is all very simple in theory because your dog could be doing all sorts of naughty things during this but I'm going to assume that that would be a good starting point for you okay you can then use that same working for food principle with all of the other areas that you've discussed as well there may be room and this is where I really need to be with you but there may be room for you actually taking a step back from your dog because sometimes we find ourselves doing so much for the dog we have so much love to give to our dogs that in fact we're sort of falling at our dog's feet metaphorically to see how much we can offer the dog and the dog has the situation especially if the dog is quite controlling which yours may be um, and, and so we can find it difficult then to get the initiative back so sometimes ignoring the dog more maybe keeping the dog off your lap especially for a week or two which is the sort of thing I would sometimes look at with uh, owners with more difficult dogs so that we actually if you like put the shoe on the other foot we say hey you know you're still I'm going to look after you I'm going to give you everything you need but I'm not going to be falling over you to uh, offer you so much affection all right so that might be something for a week or two that you make some simple steps to push back and just quick examples of that are things like no sofa access maybe blocking the dog from going upstairs if the dog's got free uh, liberty to do so bringing the dog off your bed at night if the dog is on the bed we're just sort of changing things up a bit and so that we gain a lot more initiative and this sort of uh, plan can be very effective with dogs which are uh, more careful about their thinking about how they're controlling you all right and we can do that for a week or two we would then hope to see some uh, calmer less domineering behavior from our dogs in the home and that then we can bring in that idea as I say of the desensitizing so we're doing that in a nice calm positive way once we feel that we're on what we might call dry land with this position or this whole situation we can then begin to relax a little bit and then we can begin to bring in more of that um, one to one time where the dog might be on you on your lap more so I hope that makes sense because of course it's a one-sided one-way conversation 
um, and if your dog is behaving in a way that I think it is that sort of approach may well be very effective. Even if I'm a little bit off beam there, that approach would not hurt your dog anyway um, and it could still uh, provide you with some positive outcomes, okay? But just remember in short, break down each of those little problems, get your dog to work for its daily food allowance um, and that that is something that you might be doing over a, a month I would imagine and then possibly longer and then as you begin to see behaviour that you do want which is desirable behaviour then you could revert but be careful you don't fully go back to where you were but revert to something that feels like a halfway house all right so I often call that with uh, customers what I call a new normal because we are we want to move away from where we were because we were unhappy and the dog was unhappy as well in that position. We need to go through a period of transition, put my mug down, uh, a, a transitional period where we make things better and then we end up in a what we call a new normal. So it ends up somewhere in between. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. If you would like me to elaborate more on that, um, you can either put your question in the thread below on Pet Plans page or drop me an email, nickjones at alphadogbehaviour.co.uk. So I hope that makes sense. I think we must be there, aren't we, Kim? It's amazing how quickly uh, an hour flies. Um, I'd love to leave you with some fantastic doggy wisdom. I don't have any. So apart from to say, enjoy this weather. It's absolutely stonker here today. Very warm indeed. So keep yourselves and your dogs cool. Think about early morning, later evening dog walks where it's all much cooler and I look forward to seeing you all on the next Facebook Live with Pet Plans.